Now a few words about the prosecution's burden of proof, or at least what should have been its burden of proof. Being now in the sentencing phase of the trial, the prosecution has been arguing for the drastic reduction of CO2 emissions by various means. But what must be true before a rational society adopts any of these measures? Actually, quite a lot, as we shall soon see. Let's let Al Gore represent the prosecution as we expose all the elements of its case. Remember that the accusation which must be proved is that human CO2 emissions are causing dangerous global warming. Let's assume that the earth is getting warmer. Does it then follow that we must cut our CO2 emissions? No, even if the earth is warming, that doesn't mean CO2 is the cause. For example, why punish CO2 if global warming is mostly being caused by the sun or natural cycles? Let's also assume the warming is mostly caused by rising CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Does it then follow that we must cut our CO2 emissions? No, it still needs to be proved that the burning of fossil fuels is the primary cause of rising CO2 levels. Why punish CO2 if, for example, volcanoes and outgassing from the oceans are causing the rise? But let's also assume that the burning of fossil fuels is the primary cause of rising CO2 levels. Does it then follow that we must cut our CO2 emissions? No, it still needs to be proved that the warming caused by human CO2 will be dangerous. If no harm comes from the warming, or the benefits outweigh the harm, then what is all the fuss about? So Vice President Gore has to prove each element before CO2 can be found guilty none should be assumed. If any one of them lacks a sufficient scientific basis established by some reasonable standard, then the entire case against CO2 collapses. Sufficiently proving the global warming hypothesis then sets up the conclusion that something ought to be done about it. And so we have arrived at the public policy part of the case, which has its own proof elements. Shocking as it may be to Vice President Gore and his followers, even if the global warming hypothesis has been sufficiently proved, it does not automatically follow that we should drastically curtail our CO2 emissions by any means. The prosecution first has to demonstrate the following. First, it must be true that the global warming problem is so pressing that it be given priority over other global problems such as fighting poverty, world hunger, and disease. Problems which affect us right now, not 50 years from now. In this regard, I refer you to the work of Bjorn Lomberg and the Copenhagen Consensus. Second, it must be true that any proposed mitigating measures will be effective in reducing global warming if the proposed remedy for the climate crisis won't do any good, then what's the point? In this regard, I point out that the EPA's proposed regulations for coal-fired plants are projected to have little or no effect on the climate, something which even the EPA admits. Third, it must be true that we have identified the costs of cutting CO2, this not only includes the direct costs of implementing any given solutions, but also negative unintended consequences. Take, for example, the drive for so-called sustainable fuels. It has helped create a situation in the United States where we put over 40% of our corn crop into our gas tanks, a misallocation of resources which has serious implications for the world's food supply. Global warming policies are not necessarily benign.
and any rational policy analysis will recognize that fact. The costs of global warming mitigation also should include the benefits of a warmer climate not realized by pursuing mitigating measures. Finally, the benefits must outweigh the costs. So we see that many things have to be true before it is rational to drastically cut CO2, and Mr. Gore and his allies will just have to be patient as we do our post-mortem on the trial. We also must address what standard of proof is appropriate. Policy debates either ignore or are very vague on this question. In legal cases, the standards range from a mere scintilla of evidence to beyond a reasonable doubt. We will adopt the preponderance of evidence standard, the so-called 51% standard. In other words, we will consider an element proved if we find it more likely than not to be true. Another way to define a preponderance is if we find that the greater weight or amount of evidence supports the conclusion. We also should note that the prosecution all along has argued for the application of the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle holds that we should lower the standard of proof if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, even in the absence of scientific consensus that the action or policy is not harmful. In other words, better safe than sorry. In addition, the principle would put the burden of proof on CO2 to show that it is not guilty. We reject the precautionary principle. First, the principle is ambiguous and has no agreed upon definition or criteria. In addition, it is irrational. As Michael Crichton noted in his book, State of Fear, the precautionary principle, properly applied, forbids the precautionary principle. Taking action involves risk, but so does avoiding action. So a precautionary principle that presumptively prohibits activities without considering trade-offs fails its own test of being better safe than sorry. We also observe that its ambiguity makes it arbitrary in its application and particularly susceptible to political pressures rather than scientific analysis. This is especially true in the area of global warming policy. So we will be unswayed by appeals to the precautionary principle. The prosecution has the burden of proof and must meet it. Now that our citizens investigation has some focus, Let's begin evaluating the case against CO2.